Well, welcome back, everybody. I think we had a fabulous morning, and we're going to have a fabulous afternoon. Um, our first speaker for the afternoon is Paul Joannides, uh, the prolific, uh, insightful, uh, just such a frequent contributor to uh, Michelangelo's studies. He's at, um, he's at the University of Cambridge, and uh, we all use him all the time. My favorite book to reach out for at the moment is his catalog of the drawings by Michelangelo and his assistants, followers, copyists in the Louvre. And it's just amazing how you come away from any entry sensing the continuing dialogue of, of Michelangelo and his followers. Let's give him a big hand. Thanks. Yes, thanks. Do the lights go down? I must confess that I have very little new to say. I talked about the Cupid in an unpublished lecture given at the time of the Giovanezza di Michelangelo exhibition of 1999, I think. And I've mentioned it here and there in subsequent publications, but the basic points were made then and they're only expanded here. Most of my other comments have uh, also been made in publications of one kind or another, but even if any of you have read them, uh, one could hardly expect you to remember them, so at least I may benefit from your forgetfulness. And of course, um, much of what follows uh, will inevitably duplicate what others say, and I may even tread inadvertently on one or two sensitive toes. Um, there's no point, it seems to me, in arguing about the attribution. To me, Michelangelo's authorship seems obvious. There are some people who don't believe it, but that is their problem. I do remember a mildly embarrassing dinner party at which I was obliged to defend the Cupid and indeed uh, Katia Brandt from a characteristically assertive but uh, ill-informed uh, dismissal from my hostess. Um, I've not been invited back to another dinner, um, but I learned long ago that there's no point in trying to persuade others about an attribution that is to set oneself up as a supplicant and them as judge and jury, and they always order the death penalty. All one can do is look at the evidence, explain one's interpretation of it, and leave it at that. However, since my hostess on that occasion hadn't noticed the shortest of shorter notices that I've published on the Cupid in the Burlington, and since uh, she was not alone in this, perhaps I may be permitted to recall it briefly. And of course, I wrote that before I saw the um, uh, the, the slide shown earlier this morning. Yes, two more views. That is a drawing that appeared at a sale in Paris in 2002. And sorry for the very bad um, reproduction. Double-sided, I, I didn't see it then and I haven't seen it since. Um, it seemed to be the early 16th century, I thought at the time, uh, possibly Florentine, but I wasn't sure. Um, the recto bore four sketches, which, although unrecognized by the auctioneers, were unmistakably from the Manhattan Cupid, seen from different angles. Uh, the main one uh, showed the figure from the same angle as, um, yes, self-explanatory? Uh, showed this main figure, uh, showed, the main drawing showed the figure from the same angles as Arngo's copy, which James Draper had identified. Um, the drawing is a unique uh, survival, incidentally, as far as I know at any rate. Nothing similar exists for Michelangelo's other uh, early statues. And in fact, if we're thinking of copies, I know of uh, no other multi-view copies uh, before the 1530s, I think. Um, what, I, what I've subsequently come to think about this drawing is it doesn't merely show the same statue from different angles. It shows different aspects of the statue. The drawing style varies from loosely outlined to quite uh, densely cross-hatched. And the different kinds of drawing, different kinds of pen drawing, and the different um, angles on the same sheet links it very closely indeed with early uh, Michelangelo drawings. There are a number of sheets. Uh, preparatory studies by Michelangelo, uh, which do show the same figure from different angles and drawn in different ways. 
The verso um, on the right was not reproduced in the auction catalogue, but when I was sent a photograph of it, um, it proved to be a copy of a uh, lost pen study for an ignudo from the first phase of the Sistine ceiling. Uh, Michelangelo didn't use um, make detailed pen drawings of this nature much after the first months of work on the uh, Sistine. And providentially, there is another copy of the same lost drawing in the Louvre, which also, in fact, has another uh, small figure on it, which is... Uh, does that? No, I think I'll use this one. Which, um, in fact, comes from the uh, drunkenness of Noah. Uh, the copyist must have actually had access to uh, more than one uh, Michelangelo uh, drawing. Um, the Louvre copy, I should add, um, had never been uh, reproduced. And I think it had been mentioned only uh, by Toda. So if anyone were ill-intentioned enough to think that either Catch or I had made this drawing in order to uh, substantiate the attribution of the uh, statue, uh, even if either of us had been clever enough to think of that, um, it really would not have been uh, very possible. It's debatable whether the, whether the studies um, were made, sorry, I'll go back, uh, were made after the um, cupid itself or after a preliminary model of it, but I think the vase uh, does tend to suggest that it's after the statue itself. Uh, whom, who the draftsman might be is a guess. Uh, I think Piero d'Argenta, who certainly worked with Michelangelo, is an obvious possibility, and I have uh, attempted to attribute some drawings to him which are in uh, a Michelangelo style and are closely related to Michelangelo motifs. Uh, several drawings in the Louvre uh, and others, one in Vienna, one in Oxford. Whether that's right or not, uh, I'm not. I can't affirm. It's the best guess I can make. But Piero d'Argento, who did remain with Michelangelo for a considerable period, and they seem to have been quite close, uh, may, it seems on balance, to be the most likely uh, person. The sheet is, I think, incontrovertible evidence in favour of the attribution. And there are, of course, uh, other echoes. The, um, I was surprised to see how close the arrangement of the arm, uh, the arms of the Cupid are, to those of the Doni Tondo, and I put the image in reverse just to make the point. Michelangelo returns again and again to similar motifs, which he uh, manipulates, which he rearranges, and I think that this link, well, what do you think of it? I think it's quite close. Um, there's the Salviati drawing of the early 1530s, which James Draper reproduced in a much better slide earlier. And, of course, Michelangelo himself later reworked the idea, the motif, as a Cupid, Cupid Apollo, uh, as, of course, the Manhattan figure was identified at one point as an Apollo, uh, in a moment when he was particularly preoccupied with the theme of love's archery. And this would be 35 years or so uh, later. And, um, of course, there's no strong formal uh, relation, but there is, I think, a relation of the abstracted movement of the head, the gaze, the arm, of course, reaching above the shoulder to pull an arrow out of the quiver, which you see on the uh, back. The visual culture of the Medici court was intense. We have some knowledge of Lorenzo as a collector of uh, antiquities, particularly small antiquities, and some of his direct and indirect patronage of architecture and of painting. He seems to have encouraged competition. Uh, his villa at Spedaletto was a site of context, as was the wall decoration of the Sistine, the choice of whose painters he probably uh, influenced, as uh, Zeri argued an extremely acute article. I think Lorenzo's taste on the, for, for largish works was for forceful and heroic work, and he, of course, uh, patronized uh, Signorelli, uh, whose wonderful court of Pan, uh, Charles Dempsey discussed uh, just before uh, the break. We know less about his patronage of sculpture, although Bertoldo has become uh, better known, very largely thanks to James uh, Draper, and we can be clear that Lorenzo had a real interest in statuettes in bronze, and I suspect, in all probability, in marble. 
Unfortunately, um, despite the uh, fascinating research that's been done on the, um, the, the Medici Garden, as Caroline Elam um, explained uh, earlier um, in the fascinating talk, uh, we only have a very slightly, very slight idea of what other sculptors in, uh, who may or may not have been associated with the Medici Garden, who probably were, uh, might have done. Uh, Rustici, for example, is virtually a closed book at that period, although his uh, Botticellian Europa relief in the Victorian Albert Museum is nothing like any work by Michelangelo, although, of course, it is a good uh, mythological subject. We know virtually nothing of what Andrea Sansovino and particularly Torrigiano might have done in the Medici Garden. One thing we can be sure of is that there was a strong awareness, as well as of the antique, of Donatello and of the Florentine heroic tradition, both directly and via Bertoldo. Donatello, of course, is in effect a Medici house sculptor, so he's somebody that they would, uh, if one would uh, have referred to. So I'm just going to run through uh, some early work by Michelangelo. This material is very well known to everyone in the audience, uh, but I want to run through it from a particular point of view for what is common, I think, um, and it's stylistically very diverse. But what is common, I think, is a culture of virtuosity and a culture of uh, variety. And Michelangelo is also very interested in the interaction, uh, the miscegenation, I might almost say, of uh, media. There is, of course, the Madonna of the Stairs, a pictorial relievo schiacciato, the only one of its kind, as far as we know, that Michelangelo ever executed. It evokes Donatello and Desiderio de Settignano in technique, and uh, Masaccio, and perhaps particularly Giotto in form, its great block-like forms of the uh, Virgin. It's a fusion of uh, sculpture and uh, painting. His second work, we imagine, um, and we are now talking about a sculptor who probably um, working on these at the age of uh, 16 and uh, 17. This is astonishing for uh, so young a man. His second relief, whose subject I won't attempt to um, describe, could hardly be uh, more different. It is in high relief. It's very strongly antichising, although it doesn't uh, precisely follow any uh, earlier uh, model. I think had the two not been known to be by Michelangelo, one would have been very hard put to attribute both to the same hand. I mean, the only thing they have in common, I think, is their ex works of extraordinary intensity and extraordinary um, clarity of organization and of extraordinary, uh, extraordinarily high uh, quality and ambition. But otherwise, if we were just doing a stylistic uh, comparison, I think it would be uh, very uh, problematical. Lapis and the, um, the, the battle, the brawl was in part, of course, inspired by Bertoldo's famous bronze, but since that was in turn based loosely on a Roman marble, one can't put the battle necessarily down to Bertoldo's uh, direct influence. There may well have been, in fact, I'm, I would be certain that there was an element of uh, competition. I don't think Michelangelo had any relationship with any other artist that was not uh, competitive. Um, and in the uh, relief, as well as uh, Roman marbles, uh, Roman reliefs, and uh, Bertoldo, Michelangelo looked as well to early uh, Trecento models, from which, uh, particularly um, uh, Giovanni Pisano, from which derives an extraordinary pathos, seen particularly, uh, for example, in the figure at the uh, lower left, which is not uh, particularly a feature of Bertoldo's work, or necessarily of uh, Roman reliefs. Slightly heretically, uh, and I've, uh, I imagine this would differ greatly from what uh, Nick Penny has to say uh, tomorrow, I'm inclined to think that the Manchester Madonna in the National Gallery, the unfinished picture, is also a work of this uh, very early period, not too far from uh, 1490. It's very um, block-like in its frontality, in the way that it fills the uh, the figures, the four, five figures, what, six figures, uh, 
seven figures if you include the two uh, children, fill the picture field, allowing uh, no space for the eye to move uh, outside them. And although it is uh, powerfully designed, I mean, the forms are uh, very strong, and although it is um, a work of, I think, uh, pungently original uh, personality, there is also, at the same time, a certain uh, naivety about it, I think particularly seen in the uh, angel on the uh, right-hand side. There's a certain stiffness about it, which suggests to me the work of a uh, very young man. It also relates uh, very precisely, I think, to a Florentine uh, sculptural tradition. I chose virtually at random one of the reliefs from Luca della Robbia's uh, singing gallery, which has the same uh, surface-filling uh, approach and frontality of form. And I think, in fact, Luca della Robbia is an artist who's not much spoken of in relation to Michelangelo, but there are one or two instances which make one think that he looked uh, quite closely at uh, Luca. So my impression is that this is also a rather, uh, in some respects, sub and esque work of uh, Michelangelo's first uh, Florentine period. I would, it of course is also trans transposed relief sculpture, but it's also transposed sculpture in the round. And I would uh, particularly draw your attention to this motif of the Virgin's drapery being stretched by the weight of the child. It's a motif, stretched drapery is something that Michelangelo likes, and it's of course a central motif in the uh, Rouge Madonna of uh, about 1504. Uh, It's probable that the Santo Spirito Crucifix was Michelangelo's earliest uh, sculpture proper, not a, a relief, and this introduces us to a new issue. Again, it's a rediscovery, now about half a century old, that some scholars, although a decreasing number, refuse to accept. It's, um, it has, of course, very subtle surface modeling, as James, Dra Dra as James Draper pointed out, but essentially it's conceived in silhouette uh, to be read at a distance. It's not muscular or notably uh, expressive, quote, unquote. As has often been pointed out, the arrangement was taken up by Albertinelli and uh, by Pontormo, and in it, Michelangelo introduced a kind of linear pictorialism into uh, sculpture. Once more, it is very different from either of the two sculptures that we have so far uh, considered, and it is emphatically a very slight figure um, it has nothing of the kind of elemental power of the figures in the uh, battle relief or the kind of solidity of form that we uh, associate with the Madonna of the uh, Stairs. So if Michelangelo's Manchester Madonna imitates high relief sculpture, um, this sculpture imitates a certain kind of uh, painting. Michelangelo's first recorded freestanding marble sculpture was a statue of Hercules, um, but I think it's unlikely to have been his first freestanding marble sculpture in absolute since it was four braccia, about eight feet high. Uh, I don't think that Michelangelo would, would actually have started his first, um, it's just a guess, I don't think Michelangelo would have started um, a figure on that scale without some previous uh, experience. Anyway, um, so it is possible that uh, statuettes or some figures by Michelangelo in the round uh, pre-existed uh, this. Now, I long ago proposed that this lost statue was recorded in numerous bronzes and uh, drawings. This is an example of bronze in the uh, V&A. And I still think this is possibly the least unlikely uh, solution, but I must admit this material does uh, present uh, very uh, serious difficulties. The only thing I would say in support is that nothing more convincing, no more convincing reconstruction of the lost Hercules has come to light, and this is patently a figure of uh, extraordinary invention and a very great energy. If you think of this uh, transposed into marble at about eight feet, eight feet tall, it would have been very impressive. We might note two things about it. The first is that, thinking of this as a marble, it would be very dangerously undercut. I can't think of any early marble statue that is less supported. Um, there's really very uh, little on the uh, ground. 
And in this way, it looks forward to the uh, marble uh, David, which is surely the most dangerously undercut uh, statue ever produced by anybody. He makes uh, Bernini, in fact, look relatively uh, stolid, and makes the support of Bernini look relatively stolid when we look at uh, this. It's amazing that it stands up at all. The other point is that uh, the calves are crossed, and crossed calves are a motif that uh, turn up uh, uh, repeatedly in Michelangelo. It tapers the support, it propels the gaze upwards, and it keeps the center of sculptural interest, which for Michelangelo is um, generally at the torso. It keeps Michelangelo's sculptural interest high. Uh, in this ambition, the ambition that the Hercules uh, demonstrates, if I'm right, uh, Michelangelo is imitating in marble the kinds of structure usually produced in bronze, as Anthony, late Anthony Radcliffe pointed out to me uh, many years ago. And it's appropriate, if that is correct, that Michelangelo's figure should have been reproduced in the uh, medium of bronze. I also want to make um, a, just a very brief point about the uh, stretch of the drapery across the uh, back. Similar kind of interest in uh, tension that I pointed out in the uh, Manchester Madonna. The question of the, um, this Hercules and its reproduction in bronze does raise the question of whether uh, Michelangelo himself might have worked in bronze in his youth, something to be uh, expected from an associate of Bertoldo, who of course is the most uh, important uh, maker of small bronzes of his uh, time. I think it's very likely that Michelangelo did work in bronze. One mustn't necessarily take the aged Michelangelo's um, really monodirectional commitment uh, to marble as an accurate um, account of what he, of the range of his interests in his uh, youth. If we are thinking of a bronze by Michelangelo and early, uh, to my eye, the best candidate is the uh, little Hercules, again in the Victoria and Albert Museum, which was for a very long time given to Bertoldo. It's very powerful. It has an energy and a drive and um, a physical force that really is, I don't find elsewhere in uh, Quattrocento uh, bronzes, not even by the uh, Polaioli. And um, it has rather uh, specific points in comparison with the uh, battle relief. Look at the torso, for example, and the torso of the possible Hercules in the uh, battle relief there. Uh, if you look at the head, and the head of the central figure, heavy brows, short nose, etc. Very Michelangelo's features. And if you look at the back of the figure, then again, I think the fallen uh, centaur, the figure uh, dragging Dianara away. These, it seems to me, are close. Um, if the V&A bronze is not by Michelangelo, then it is by somebody who has looked very uh, carefully at Michelangelo. And it is, um, there's simply, if we date it, shall we say, within the period early 1490s to uh, around about the time of the David, I'm simply unaware of any other possible uh, candidate for it. And a minor point about it is that I was told by Peter Mottua of the Victorian Albert Museum that the um, provenance of this bronze is that is from, in fact, the uh, Strozzi. We have no uh, secure evidence for the St. John that Michelangelo carved for Lorenzo di Pier Francesco de' Medici, and little more for the lost uh, sleeping Cupid, which, of course, was the occasion of Michelangelo going to Rome. Between Florence and Rome, he had worked on the tomb of St. Dominic in uh, Bologna, and I just show you one of the uh, three figures that he carved, the little figure of the statuette, in effect, of uh, St. Proculus, very unbalanced, in a rather rapid movement, um, great deal of detail in the uh, drapery and, for example, the, uh, the uh, 
um, you know, the legging, the, 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 the boots, quite close, in fact, to certain elements in uh, Bertoldo bronzes that um, uh, Dr. Draper showed us earlier on. Furthermore, it's worth evoking the uh, Michelangelo's Bolognese stay because when he was um, uh, working on the tomb of St. Dominic, he was in very close contact with the work of Niccolo de Larca. These, this figure was, in effect, uh, was a companion to figures by Niccolo de Larca, who was probably the greatest marble virtuoso of his uh, day. Michelangelo would be, have seen what um, an absolutely was supreme marble uh, virtuoso could um, have accomplished, and this would, of course, have uh, provoked his own uh, competitive instincts. Michelangelo went to Rome uh, because Cardinal Riario had bought uh, his Cupid in thinking it was uh, an antique, and he then began to work for uh, the Cardinal. Luckily, we have immediately contemporary testimony about the controversy, whether it was a Michelangelo's Cupid, sleeping Cupid was a, uh, an antique or a modern work, uh, immediately contemporary letters, otherwise the story of um, Condivi and Vasari would have certainly been dismissed by the more knowing of our confrères as a topos. Actually, and this point was made earlier on, Michelangelo uh, could have had a very promising career as a forger. Vasari and Condivi, he, Vasari and Condivi say that in his youth he would borrow old master drawings, uh, copy them, artificially age the shoots, uh, <laughs> artificially age the sheets, and return the copies to the owners as the originals. And this was not because he was swindling them, he liked to surprise them. I mean, he really, he, he was, I think, something of a uh, show-off. Um, in Rome, he began the Bacchus for Cardinal Riario. It's a two-figure group. Uh, in the round. We are supposed to go uh, round it. We don't see the little satire, an extraordinary complex pose um, from the uh, front. It is, of course, uh, directly indebted to the antique, but it doesn't imitate any antique type. And I think I would um, modify something that was said earlier on, the grounds that this is not really, uh, if you like, a forgery of an antique. It is a deliberate paragone with the antique. It's a deliberate attempt by Michelangelo to show that he can do something more complicated, something more uh, virtuosic, something much more deeply undercut, something uh, more unbalanced than anything the antique would have uh, suggested. It's... Um, the... The, there's a great uh, variety of materials, the drapery, uh, the grapes, the hair of the satire, the hair of uh, Bacchus, um, the imitation rock on which they are standing. It is an extremely uh, complex and ambitious uh, figure. And one might also look at the little satire and think of Adriano Fiorentino, the signed uh, bronze in uh, Vienna, who, of course, cast a uh, Bertoldo's uh, Bellerophon. The pose of the Mar Michelangelo's marble is infinitely more complex, but it's a similar kind of uh, characterization. So again, the link with bronze as a kind of model, a model to be surpassed in uh, marble. This brings us to the Manhattan uh, Cupid. It's an all-round figure, and it was perceived to be so as the drawing showed. Uh, the most closely related figure, as um, James Draper first pointed out, is Bertoldo's unfinished Orpheus, which, as we now know, is a very much earlier figure than had previously been uh, imagined. So this is something that Michelangelo presumably would have known, uh, I mean, would have been well known in the, uh, the circles of which the young Michelangelo moved for uh, some uh, time. There's also, I think, a relation, yes, there's another view, but... James Draper has already talked a lot about this, so there's no need to pursue it. There's also a relation to a Bertoldo that, as far as I'm aware, came to light only after Dr. Draper had published his book, uh, The Archer in the uh, Hermitage, which does show uh, an interest, again, in arrows and bows and that kind of thing. Um, 
And I'm also rather struck by um, a couple of features of the Cupid in relation to the antique. Its elongation has puzzled uh, many people, but elongation is a frequent feature of antique um, of Hellenistic bronzes and Hellenistic uh, terracottas. In fact, indeed, even Hellenistic marbles. And I put the image on the uh, right up, simply on the right up, simply as a as, as a comparison chosen almost at uh, random. And I was also struck recently by a similarity of pose of the uh, Cupid to this figure in a group of um, probably uh, Cupid and Psyche. It was then discovered very much uh, later than Michelangelo, discovered, if I remember rightly, in the, in, in the 17th century. But I do wonder whether Michelangelo was aware of some uh, relief version of this um, available in the late Quattrocento. If not, then Michelangelo is thinking in a manner which is um, almost, almost that of uh, a Hellen Hellenistic uh, sculptor. And I also want to point to the feature of uh, elongation. Uh, people don't like the idea, and people think of Michelangelo as chunky and uh, powerful, but he is also interested at times in extreme elongation. Vasari says he would draw figures 10 uh, heads high if he wished to. There's quite a lot of elongation in his drawings and some structural projects of the uh, 1520s, but rather than cite those, I thought I'd look at something closer to the Cupid in time, this drawing of about 15-4 uh, in Rennes, which shows an extraordinarily uh, elongated uh, young man drawn in Michelangelo's uh, most virtuosic uh, pen style. Even more elongated than the Cupid. I think when one looks at this, then the Cupid becomes, uh, the, the proportions of the Cupid fall into, um, uh, fall into place uh, much more uh, readily and uh, acceptably. The Bacchus, we know, was carved in 1496 to 1497. There really can be no serious doubt that the Manhattan statue is a Cupid which was also owned by Galli and was also described by Aldo Randi, and whose history seems to be, as far as we know, continuously at Roman. 1497 is the date that the sources imply. It has been suggested, um, and I think uh, Dr. Draper uh, feels this, that the statue should be dated earlier, but this is to introduce a notion of stylistic development that seems to me not wholly appropriate to Michelangelo's work of the 1490s. Indeed, I would contest the notion that there is any clear uh, stylistic development in Michelangelo's work of the 1490s, and I'd argue that to do so is to assume that there was, is to create a false teleology. The young Michelangelo was self-confident, brilliant, astonishingly brilliant, competitive, eager to impress and to astound. Above all, he was a virtuoso, eager to try his hand in all fields and to innovate in all fields. His analytical intelligence is also demonstrated by his success as a forger, which implies the ability to enter the minds of others and to subdue his own personality. That a personality so powerful uh, could subdue itself is an extraordinary um, indication of his intellect. When we approach such an artist, we must always bear in mind that he's infinitely more intelligent and subtle than any of us. And if we track him, we must do so with the humility that Michelangelo inspired in those who knew him. In July or August of 1497, after he had completed the Bacchus, Michelangelo bought a piece of marble for five ducats, uh, precisely half what the marble uh, that, from which he had carved the Bacchus had cost. This was uh, initially to do a piece of work for Pio de' Medici, who was then in exile in Rome. Piero let Michelangelo down in some unspecified way, and the sculptor decided to work on the block for his own pleasure. He had several months between then and going to Carrara to excavate marble for the Pietà, and this, I think, was probably when he carved the Cupid. How appropriate it would have been uh, for all the terms in the equation had Michelangelo planned for Piero a marble which alluded to, but outdid, the unfinished bronze designed and cast by Piero's fathers. 
favourite sculptor, and, of course, Michelangelo's own sculptural master. But Michelangelo reprises uh, and develops what Bertoldo, in marble what Bertoldo had done in bronze. The theme will be Medicean, but carved outside Florence. And Jacopo Galli, who profited from Riario's presumed incomprehension of the Bacchus, profited too from Piero's default. Thank you. <laughs>